Welcome, everyone. Welcome. It's very nice to see everybody again after such a long time. Welcome to um, the Westchester County Association 2021 Real Estate Summit. Now, we're all continuing to live through a shared sociological experience with the lingering effects of the pandemic. If you focus on the real estate sector, the data tells an interesting tale. Some older vintage commercial buildings in Westchester are poised for adaptive reuse. These buildings are nearing the end of their useful life, and COVID-19 has simply accelerated the process. However, as businesses large and small look to grow and headquarter here in the county, there remains a strong need for high-class office space, albeit with next generation design, operation, and amenities. That's what today's program is all about. As many of you know, the Westchester County Association has identified sustainability as one of the foundational pillars of the regional economy. Sustainability and digital connectivity will play an enormous role in the future of CRE. We believe that commercial real estate leaders have an opportunity to affirm these concepts as core to their industry. It's not simply a nod to regulatory pressure, although there will be a fair amount of that. It's that business leaders are increasingly informed of environmental and social governance as accretive to their bottom lines. And that extends to their physical workspace, how it's designed, how it interacts with the natural environment, how it interacts with their workers and their customers, and what it says about their brands. Today, we explore these smart design concepts in general, and also in the context of a development right here in Westchester, the West Park campus in White Plains. Now, I'd like to thank our event supporters for today, the Building and Realty Institute, Langan, McCullough, Goldberger, and Stout, and Dandelion Energy. Also, our event sponsors, Benchmark Title, M&T Bank, Wells Fargo, Buzz Creators, Cuddy and Fetter, and The Catalyst, that's the county's Office of Economic Development. And a special thanks to our presenting sponsor, Onyx, who is the developer of West Park. Now, I'd like to introduce our county executive, George Latimer, for a special greeting. George always recognizes his team, and I'll do likewise with gratitude to Bridget, and Joan, and Ken, and Emily, and Deborah, and all of the other members of his team, some of which have joined us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you here today. And as I look at the format for what you're going to be discussing, you have a dynamic keynote address ahead of you and uh, a very uh, informed group of panelists that will have a, a give and take amongst themselves. So I think you'll get a lot out of this session. And uh, I'm very appreciative, as, as Mike said, that Bridget Gibbons, our Director of Economic Development, is with us here today, Deb Novick, uh, who's here, who works with Bridget as her Assistant Director, uh, to be part of the learning process that we all are going through. And wherever we are in this, uh, the responsibilities that we have for the organizations that we're with, uh, the county government is also in a learning mode. Things are changing out there in the world around us, and it's changing fast. And we have to try to be nimble and creative and figure out how do we adjust to that. And as difficult as it is for a corporate organization to do that, given tradition and structures, it's even more difficult for governments to do it, because we live in a world that's more driven by laws and regulations than by the need to reach a bottom line. I had the good fortune for 20 years, somewhat overlapping with the beginning of my public career, to be in the private sector, working for subsidiaries of major U.S. corporations in the uh, hospitality industry, where I was a director of marketing locally, worked my way up to corporate office, and uh, in, in days which are now almost antiquated because it really preceded things that we take for granted now from the social networks and, uh, of course, all the technologically driven things that uh, really shape how we market and how we present what we do. But I think of one very fundamental conversation I had when I was 13 years old. I grew up on the south side of Mount Vernon, and my dad was a blue-collar worker. He moved up uh, after World War II from Brooklyn to Westchester County, where he met my mother, who grew up not far from here in Harrison. 
And uh, I asked my father once, uh, you know, what made him leave Brooklyn to come to Westchester County. That is a very common reality now with many of our new neighbors having come from different sections of Brooklyn. I don't know if it was that common back in the post-World War II era, but like any 13-year-old boy asking his father a question, my father looked at me sort of the way Clint Eastwood, when he was Dirty Harry, would look at his superior officer with an arched eyebrow and how can you ask me such a stupid question? And um, I, I'll never forget this. He was a man of few words, but he'd say these pungent things in very short bursts of, of uh, commentary. And he looked at me and he pointed out with his two fingers and said, two reasons. Number one, it's near New York City. Number two, it's not New York City. So, so many years, 45 years later, there's a Westchester County economic development strategy. We're near New York City, we're not New York City. Thank you, Dad, for uh, the most obvious grasp that his 13-year-old son should have picked up on, on the fly. But when I was younger, growing up in this county and growing up in the southern part of the county, I wasn't always aware of what was happening in the rest of the county. Economic development, real estate growth, was the recruitment and the retention of major U.S. corporation headquarters leaving Midtown Manhattan and coming out to the suburbs. Now, some of that happened in northern New Jersey. Some of that happened in Fairfield County, Connecticut. A little bit of it went to the island, and Westchester County became the home for IBM, PepsiCo, and the company I worked for later on, Nestle USA. We had, once upon a time, AMF here. We now have MasterCard and Regeneron is a locally uh, built uh, major corporation that came from them. But the future requires us to think differently. And as you look at the discussions you're going to have tonight and then the rest of our you know, business career as we go forward, we're gonna have to look at ways to take assets that made sense in a certain economic climate and readjust it. And those of us in government are gonna to have to take the tools of government, the way we incentivize business to shape ourselves into those kinds of situations. We have to deal with zoning as an issue, which never thought of what the Platinum Mile was gonna look like in a world where commercial office space was less in demand and residential space was in increasing demand, and a host of things along those lines that we have to shape. We try to do that in the, in the county government. We do it imperfectly, and we could do it better, and that's our challenge. We also recognize that we have to deal with, with the costs of everything, and part of it now, as we look at how do we convert uh, into uh, the kind of sustainable energy that we can afford in the years to come. We embrace getting our bus fleet out of diesel buses into hybrid electric and electric buses. We have a fleet of 330 buses. We're now just shy of 200 buses that have been converted, and we have a few all-electric buses now. They're expensive. They're more expensive, but in the long run, they'll be more sustainable in terms of the less amount of uh, uh, traditional gasoline that we use. And to create that infrastructure, we've used uh, the land that we own in various parks and other locations for uh, electric vehicle charging stations, which you see in certain locations, but that infrastructure has to grow out to deal with what we think will be the changing demand of consumers to have electric cars in lieu of, or hybrid cars, in lieu of the traditional uh, gas vehicles. And we're trying to figure out how to do that in the same time that you're trying to figure to do that in, in the private sector. Our commitment uh, in any element of government is fixed by the amount of time we spend in an office, and if we spend four years or eight years, whatever that tenure is, someone else comes in. But the reality of the marketplace will train all of us. I did learn that years ago, and I try to take those measures to heart when we sit and talk about public policy. And I think it's an exciting time. Uh, I look at those of you who are younger than me, and uh, I see the challenges as you see the challenges, but every generation in this country has risen to those challenges. My father's generation, arguably your grandparents' generation, um, fought a world war and lived through a depression, and they somehow overcame it. So the cl current climate, the world of government, the divisiveness of government, uh, the challenges that we have uh, in a very global competitive environment where China uh, a rising economic power is out in the, in the world in a way that they were not when we uh, came out of the post-war era. All of these things are challenges for our current day and for the generation to come. And, and I think we embrace those challenges. And in our backyard, in the real estate of Westchester County, we know that the most important part of real estate, as I was told a long time ago, location, 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 we are located next to a beautiful river. We're located next to a fabulous Long Island Sound. We're located where we have reservoirs that serve as beautiful lakes, and those features attract people to want to live here and to want to work here. And of course, as Stan Latimer once told me, 
We sit right next to the most dynamic city on the globe, and we're not that same city. We're different. We offer different opportunity. So hopefully together through the business sector, the government sector, the nonprofit sector, we'll find that sweet spot, that way that we can cooperate. And I would hope that uh, for whatever period of time that uh, myself and my team are in office, you will find us to be good partners and uh, good friends. Thank you very much for the chance to say a few words. I look forward to your keynote speaker and your panel. Thank you all. Next to the podium is Bill Cuddy, who is the chairperson of the Westchester County Association Real Estate Task Force and the driving force behind many of our initiatives such as affordable housing and the policy playbook. For those of you who don't know who Bill, he is the executive vice president of CBRE, responsible for their Westchester and Fairfield offices, and has worked with to solve the real estate problems of some of the biggest corporations and nonprofits uh, in the community. Bill. Right, good afternoon, everybody. Great to see you. It's wonderful to have the uh, County Association uh, Real Estate Summit back uh, live and in person, and great to see all of your faces. Uh, Michael, you and the staff, Julia, Amy, and everyone else are doing a fantastic job. So thanks for your enthusiasm and energy putting this and other events together. Uh, I do have the uh, privilege of uh, introducing my associate, Jacqueline Novotny. Um, Jacqueline and the Onyx team uh, are responsible for the uh, West Park campus on Westchester Avenue, uh, and it's, uh, there's a lot of theory and, and uh, uh, white papers and discussions about how to deploy technologies and broadband and really integrate ESG type strategies into real estate, uh, but it's under Onyx leadership and really Jacqueline's leadership of that assignment to try to harness that to make that campus and Westchester County be at the forefront of what's new in our business. So let me introduce a the leader of our business, and that assignment, Jacqueline Novotny. Good afternoon, everybody. It's nice to see everybody back in person. Um, I certainly echo the sentiment of uh, Michael and Bill and uh, Mr. Latimer in saying that. So today I have the pleasure of introducing you to Onyx, for those of you who are not, do not know them. Um, they are a privately held commercial real estate company that owns about 9.6 million square feet of um, assets between New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania. And locally, they are known for 1311 Marinick Avenue and also West Park. For those of you who are not familiar with West Park, it is a um, two-building commercial asset located on Westchester Avenue at 1111 and 1129 Westchester Avenue, comprised of 373,000 square feet of office space, Class A office space built out to lead gold standards. Um, recently, or not recently, but the property has been headquartered locations for 9X, 9West, uh, Starwood, and most recently, Pepsi. Um, Onyx's principles are known as being technology visionaries. So when they were told and notified by Pepsi that they would be vacating this year, and returning to their headquarters location on Anderson Hill Road, Onyx took a very forward approach and progressive approach, and they decided to issue a, an RFP to turn their campus into one of the first smart building campuses in the country. Um, as such, we sent out the RFP and received an overwhelming, overwhelming excuse me, response of about 20 companies who responded. And over about six to nine months, uh, we worked with Onyx to vet these companies and see who would be the best fit to partner with Onyx to deliver um, a potential smart building campus. Uh, after the period, we, um, Onyx, excuse me, determined that they were going to partner with Atos, who is our keynote speaker today. And together with Atos, they have worked to put together a menu of options that they can deliver to any potential tenant to allow the tenant to potentially upgrade and renovate these buildings into smart building campuses. Um, so as such, um, I will be introducing to you shortly Karan Chattel of Atos, but right now I'm going to just show you a quick video of West Park to show you some of the um, improvements that Onyx is taking, which will be done initially um, touchless upgrades upgrades to the HVAC systems. I think, as, as we all know, that's kind of forefront state of mind with COVID and everything that's happened. 
Um, so I'll play that right now and then introduce you to Mr. Chateau. So if anybody would like to tour the property, you know who to reach out to. And we do have some marketing materials outside if anybody wants to grab anything for themselves or clients, etc. Uh, now I have the pleasure of uh, introducing all of you to Karan Chital. Karan is the representative from Atos. He is a graduate, a graduate excuse me, from the University of Oxford School of Business. He's a leading strategist for transformational global programs and an experienced strategic advisor with a successful history of working in the information technology and services industries. Please welcome Karan. Well, thank you. That was quite an introduction. Uh, thank you. I appreciate everyone's time here. My name is Karan. Um, so I, I want to... I wanna talk a very f uh, few minutes about who Artos is. If you've never heard our name, which I won't take it personally if you haven't. Um, so we, we are a French company, yeah? We, we started in the North American market by acquiring organizations like Xerox, ITO, you might have heard of them if you printed anything ever. Um, or organizations like uh, and Thelia, which is healthcare market, or you would have heard about us because we've done American Dream, which is kind of somewhere in the neighborhood here in New Jersey. Uh, so we, we are a large company with 12 billion in revenues, 100,000 plus employees. And what we are really proud about is what we've done for the Olympics, yeah? So every time you see an Olympic event, you've actually seen what goes behind the scenes. So we'll, I'll talk today about what we're going to do for West Park, as well as what the market is, right? Why smart buildings are important? Why is it more important for sustainability goals for any of your tenants if you were considering to host a tenant? Why is it important? So I'll talk about all of those things. And before I do that, I'll play a quick video.
So thank you um, again. So just want to level set why are smart buildings really important? Why are they important? So technology, as you use it every day, is prevalent in your daily life. So why not in real estate? Why not in buildings? Did you know that buildings actually are 40% responsible for the carbon emissions? Buildings alone emit 40% of carbon emissions. And it, I'm sure you're aware that a human being spends about 90,000 hours in office space. So that's one third of your life, or 3,750 days of your lifetime. So that's a lot of time. So things that are important for any building to be carbon emission free, you know, for, uh, like I said, 40% of the carbon footprint globally is actually compensated by smart buildings or buildings which are not smart. So what we're going to do, if I can really move to the next slide here. Sorry about that. So uh, what we're going to do for West Park is actually bring in innovation that will trigger making the building smarter to reduce that 40% carbon emission that you've seen or that, that, that I just mentioned. Also, I also want to touch upon really important factors which West Park as a next generation smart campus is going to do, which are it creates new revenue opportunities for tenants who actually go in and want to be part of the West Park ecosystem because now you can actually go out and drive more differentiated you know, products, solutions. Can you book an automation, oh sorry, can you book your uh, conference room through your phone as you actually go about living your normal life? Are you COVID proof? Meaning, do you know whether the building was actually sanitized before you enter the building? So those are the things that we're actually gonna do, bring in an end-to-end -end experience to make tenants, people, visitors, consumers, more, call it, well-being after the COVID era, because it's important. It's important to have that information. It's important to have that data to be able to then go back and say, guys, I, I know I'm going to a safe place. I know I'm going to uh, a, a, an office which is more digitally equipped, which I can get real-time access to. So those things are what we're going to do for West Park. And then, so just, you know, I, I give you all something to think about. Because I was told I only had five minutes. Um, did you know that by turning two degrees off your thermostat, whether in your house or in your buildings, whether commercial or residential, can actually decrease 2,000 pounds of carbon emissions? If you didn't know, now you know. In Europe, which is where my organization is from, well, we don't use black trash bags. Have you ever thought why that is? We don't use black trash bags at all in Europe because actually the pigmentation of a black trash bag is much harder, produces more carbon emissions than other colored. So you can find pink trash bags or blue trash bags in Europe. So just for another thought for you guys to think about. And lastly, I do want to, I'm sure everyone would raise their hands. Everyone uses Outlook or Gmail or something and this was the dialogue we were having on this table about, did you know actually archiving and deleting emails also compensates for carbon emissions? Meaning, if you delete email, which you don't need, you're actually reducing and compensating for the carbon emissions. So just for knowledge awareness, if you didn't know about it, but if you knew about it, then brilliant. So with last thing, uh, I do want to play that video, and I'll shut up and hand it to the panelists. <laughs>
So the real question becomes, are you doing your part for a better tomorrow? Yeah, and I'll stop now and hand it back to panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for those really cool videos. Um, we'll get the panelists up here now. My job is just to introduce the panel moderator. That's Stephen Mezio, who is the executive director of the brand new Pace University Lubin Center for Sustainable Business. Prior to joining the faculty at Pace, Stephen enjoyed a long career in business working for some of the most well-known accounting and consulting firms on the globe. He's been involved in the involving field of ESG and business sustainability for over a decade and lectures frequently on these issues. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you for that introduction. I'd like to invite the panel members to come up. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I have a, the privilege of moderating the panel. And uh, the way we're going to approach this is we're going to try to be as interactive as we can be. Our topic is, as you might have seen, is, is we're going to discuss sort of three macro level issues, sustainability, interconnectivity, and technology as it relates to commercial real estate. And the way we're going to approach the panel is we have about uh, three or four macro level questions that we've agreed on might be uh, stimulating to the audience and to our discussion. Um, I'm just going to sort of pivot the question to the group. Uh, they'll each sort of weigh in on it, and then we'll move on to the next question. And what we're going to try to do is leave as much time as we can at the end of those questions to open it up for uh, Q&A. What I'd like to do, though, is start uh, just to spend a few minutes and allow the panel members to give you a little bit of an introduction and their background. So um, we start with you. Hi, everyone. Um, <clears throat> my name's Kyle Strumfels. I work for Langan, but I work for Langan in, in a different capacity than most uh, people would recognize the company. So um, I came over with a few colleagues to start Langan's ESG practice. And while it's not generally... Um, we don't generally work in the commercial real estate space. We generally evaluate ESG performance of businesses. Um, so this, this Wells Fargo handout that you all have, I've just been looking at it and it's all ringing true to me. Um, but I offer a different perspective than, the, than a, a real estate person. Um, and I look at ESG in many different sectors, so this is really interesting to me. Um, my background is a bachelor's degree from William & Mary and a Master of Environmental Policy from University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I've been at Langen for a little less than a year, but in the environmental field for 20. Christopher. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Chris Fisher. I'm a lawyer. Uh, I'm an advocate, a collaborator in real estate and telecom. And I've been doing um, uh, projects throughout the county, the region, the state for over 25 years. Uh, I serve as the managing partner of Cuddy and Fader, which is based right here in Westchester. We're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year as a law firm. Uh, we've got a rich tradition of high caliber practice of law with really a service first mindset. Um, I also contribute in many different capacities to communities um, in various leadership roles. I've served as uh, president of the New York State Wireless Association. I've served on the New York State Task Force for upstate um, and cellular connectivity. Uh, and I also do a lot of work here with the Westchester County Association, our host today. And I'm, I'm really happy that they put on this event addressing some really fundamentally challenging and exciting topics. Um, one note for our professor, I'm also a proud graduate of uh, the Pace University School of Law and their number one ranked national environmental program, um, class of 94, and really appreciate being here with everybody. And for the record, I am not wearing a tie <laughs> only because these panelists said to me, as a lawyer, I don't think that's sustainable. Give it up. Yeah, we all agreed that we weren't going to wear ties, and then suddenly we got the memo this we, morning. We got the memo. So, so. You're, you're the leader on this one. Um, my name is David Garden. I'm a senior vice president at RxR Realty. We're an owner, operator, and developer um, in the New York metropolitan region. We own, um, under management, we have over 26 million square feet. Um, of office and residential, a gross asset value of about $20 billion. We have 7,100 residential units throughout the New York metropolitan region. We also invest in infrastructure. We uh, just secured an agreement with the Port Authority and we're moving forward with a, uh, a new terminal for JetBlue at JFK Airport. Um, 
the, 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 the speaker that introduced our panel talked about the evolving world of ESG. And I think not only regulators and companies are trying to figure out what actually is ESG. Because to be honest, how we view ESG is very different than how we viewed it pre-pandemic. It's evolved much more since then. As, uh, as Mike pointed out, COVID has, has served an accelerant, and we'll talk about some of the, the, the ways that it has accelerated things. So at RxR, our, our operational ethos is doing good and doing well means doing better. And so what we try and do is embed as much as possible our ESG practices, but recognizing that the world is evolving and how we approach sustainability, building community, all those things that are considered core functions of ESG, those definitions are changing. So I'll go that into more detail now, but that's my background. Hi everybody, I'm Charlie Buscarino. I'm the president and CEO of the Clarion Group. So we are, I'm the tech guy, okay? So we, <laughs> we do the technology piece. Um, you know, the Clarion Group has been around for 18 years, providing some projects you may be familiar with. I think we, we heard the mentioning of the American Dream Project. We've been involved in that from 2004 to today, all right? Um, we're certainly involved in the West Park Project, very proud to be part of that. Um, and I, our focus, when we look at technology, and like I said, I'm the tech guy, <laughs> it's not about the technology. The technology's an enabler for something else. Traditionally, that might be reducing capital costs, reducing operating costs, generating revenue, or creating a superior customer experience. But that conversation has now evolved, okay? ESG, and certainly the the E and the S, okay, is enabled by technology. And so our focus on creating infrastructure and providing data and creating knowledge and awareness around how these buildings are operating is something we're proud to be able to do as part of our skill set and bring that forward to bring the awareness so that action can be taken and the G in that can be put in place to frankly make a better world. So that's our role as, as the tech guys. <laughs> thank you, thank you, gentlemen. And, and I think we've heard repeatedly, as uh, at least since the, the conference began, this idea about what do we do now in terms of sustainability and integrating sustainability into our organizations. I, I've been working with businesses for the last ten years with with this notion of ESG and sustainability across the sectors. And I can tell you, even to this day, there's still quite a bit of uncertainty on terminology, on lingo, on strategy, on what does this mean to our individual organizations and institutions? How do we integrate ESG into the DNA of our organization? And, and, and this idea of integrated purpose we're hearing much about across, across all the sectors. People, planet, and profit. So the idea of social responsibility, environmental stewardship, and the G, which, which my background is in corporate governance advisory, the G in ESG really transcends across profitability, economic viability, and true sustainability. If, if an institution or organization doesn't survive, they're not going to be very mu much responsible socially or very much in, uh, ha have very much of an impact on the environment. So this idea of integrate, an integrated purpose of being successful, however an institution defines success, but at the same time in a balanced approach contributing both to the E and the S in ESG. So the way we were going to approach the, the way we're going to approach the panel discussion now is really focus in on these, on these, on these big macro level topics of connectivity, technology, and sustainability. So we thought we'd start with the first question, and, and because Christopher is not wearing a tie, he was picked to go first <laughs> now. Um, uh, Christopher, the topic's connectivity and the digital divide, and, and so the, the big question that we have for you is how, how are new technologies and offerings being leveraged within the commercial real estate and public sectors, and where are we in their evolution as part of the ESG and value creation sort of notion? I think I got this question, and, and I got to do a shout out for the Yankees, you know, that somehow I'm Yogi Bear up on this panel, I'm supposed to catch that fastball come up with all of the, uh, the answers, but the reality is we're gonna have a conversation, and I gotta give you a Yogi Bearism. Uh, when you come to the fork in the road, take, take it. Right. <laughs> and that's kinda how I feel about technology, ESG, and the confluence of what we're talking about. Um, there's really no wrong fork. 
It's about how we're going to collaborate together to solve problems um, that our communities are facing. And we can talk about it in the in-building environment uh, when it comes to um, smart buildings, how that is absolutely critical for energy sustainability, um, carbon, and what we're dealing with our, in terms of our built environment. Uh, the other reality is that technology is evolving really fast. I talk a lot about 5G and wireless communications, and that is a critical opportunity for our communities, but we have issues when it comes to uh, deploying this technology from an outside-in perspective, whether that be um, a state where we have a high tax philosophy and maybe a chase the capex away approach. We've got to change some of that. Um, also look at our local barriers possibly to the deployment of technology and really come up with a new collaborative approach. Um, I think there's tremendous opportunity right now for a lot of different reasons on this confluence that we're going to talk a little bit more on this panel, uh, whether it be through our partners at the county um, and municipalities. They really have a unique opportunity right now to take some of the funding, the American Rescue Plan and ARPA funds, and whether it's seed money or leadership where we're going to bring the private and public sector together on some of the things the WCA has been advocating for, like a center for digital adoption. Um, these are the kinds of things where we can really take local sustainable action to create lasting change. Um, and I think when we start to talk about technology, we really have to be fair and honest with each other. This room has tremendous access to technology, all of us. Uh, in our daily lives, in our pockets, at home, in the car, at the office. There are a number of residents in this county, um, and it's substantially high, and there are pockets where there are digital deserts. That may not be because the broadband pipe doesn't reach them because they have access and affordability issues. We have a responsibility, and I find that it's um, a moral one, and it's actually an economic one, where if we bring those folks back to the workforce, we help with telemedicine and connect them better to um, social determinants of health that have positive outcomes in their lives, education, that this is really a fundamental, um, pivotal moment where we can marry technology, uh, we can bring this community together, put the public and private sector together in the right systemic approach to real lasting change. How we do it, is going to be critical to bring all stakeholders along. Um, it's a challenge. I don't have all the answers. <laughs> I tried to catch the fastball, but as you know, you would say, let's just take that fork in the road. Well, so um, we all agreed beforehand that we were going to try and make this as conversational, not put um, each other too much on the spot, but you can't mute us. So okay. now we're going to have to, unlike <laughs> when we're in I'm a professor, I can mute <laughs> <laughs> I don't dispute that. Um, <laughs> just curious, one of the things we were talking about beforehand, I don't think anybody in this room would disagree that we shouldn't figure out ways to address the digital divide. The county executive would say, yes, we need to address the digital divide. The mayor of New York City will say, we, yes, we need to do digital divide. And you mentioned all the different resources. We're in real estate. I'm just curious. If you were to boil it down and, and simply, instead of just a resource issue, and you mentioned it's not connecting the broadband to certain communities, and yes, there's affordability issues, how do we actually do and achieve that, uh, reach out, fix that digital divide to get to those communities that need it the most? Yeah, that is a great question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I would approach it this way. Uh, you know, a lot of things that have served this country well when it comes to a competitive economic marketplace for broadband services um, has in some ways created uh, an environment where we haven't addressed that issue. And we can all as, um, you know, and I certainly as an advocate and as an attorney can say why there are certain approaches, whether they be policy or otherwise, um, that have created that issue. But really it comes back to we have some uh, dysfunction in Washington. We have um, a 30-year history on approach, and we really can't afford to wait for Washington to solve these problems. Mm -hmm. And the, the solution, therefore, really isn't transformative Washington down, it's grassroots here up, and how are we gonna put the people in the room to solve the problem? I can go into a lot more detail on how you try to do that, but I think fundamentally that's part of the issue. So Chris, I, I got a question. So I know that you know part of the concept is you know certainly we have to identify those islands and get coverage and so on to make sure that everybody's connected. But are we also in a position because as I watch the technology side of it, we are now introducing faster technology. 
that gives you know uh, folks access to more data. And so when I look at who drives that, you know, it's the Amazons and so on. So there's incentive to you know create uh, to build around those who are the consumers, the greatest consumers, um, increasing that divide. Is, is that something that is, is happening? And so as we're trying to patch the hole, we're, we, we've got a bigger hole that we're dealing with? I think that's a real risk based on just the economic structure in which we're developing out broadband infrastructure, right? Because um, all of us have industries we support and ROI becomes an important conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and if you go back to the construct we've been working with, um, the truth is, is that state and localities don't have the power to change that from a, what I would call a little bit more of a stick approach. Mm -hmm. So what we gotta do is we gotta flip it and say, how are we gonna work with the carrot approach um, and, and address what is an equity issue? Mm -hmm. um, we already have a digital divide and that could be at whether you talk about speed, affordability, access, um, and as we go to these new transformative technologies, mm -hmm. 5G and others where um, there's a new promise and a new opportunity. Um, we just can't take this moment and leave folks behind. And I really would reach out to all of the colleagues that are in the room, whether you're in government, the private sector, we have a, a, we have a part in a leadership role to play on solving that problem. And, and right now, barring some fundamental change in Washington, I think it has to start with us right here. Well, and we're revisiting the equation, right? So when we start looking at smart districts, and we're looking at CBRS and connectivity and so on, you know, on a new technology that you know, people don't really know how to handle it or how that works with the carriers and so on. Um, there are opportunities to kind of hit reset and say, all right, we have, we're in this inflection moment. How do, we, how do we address these issues? And that would be great. See, that's where I would like to learn from you about how are those use cases mm -hmm. where we can monetize a CBRS yeah. network to really solve the problem because if I look at um, and, and a shout out to WCA, but the, the Y zone in Yonkers, which we're going to use CBRS, we have a tremendous number of partners. So when I say grassroots, we're working with the city of Yonkers, West Hab, um, Motorola, Crown, YPI, City of Fordham, WCA, STEM Alliance, in a group of partners to try to get internet to 500 households that are in uh, uh, underprivileged areas, communities of color, largely immigrant populations. Um, try to solve this problem, but also get them device ownership and tech education. Mm -hmm. But nothing's for free, right. right? So how do we get them the service, but leverage some of the things you know on use cases and commercial applications to try to make that fundamentally work? So it's, it's one is who controls the asset. Okay, so start there, all right? So there's definitely advantages and incentives for private. So there, there's a, a project we're doing outside of Washington that's going to have CBRS. And so the promise there is from a, you know, um, where a tenant is in multiple buildings, the ability for them to treat that as though it's one ecosystem for themselves, a private network. So there's incentive for them to, you know, engage in that. If that asset is controlled by a benevolent holder, okay, that leverages that to create opportunities for other aspects and, um, and share that asset and monetize it um, to make it available for more, you know, those are the types of things that have to happen but it, it comes down to he who controls that asset. All right, quick question. We got some folks from West County, Westchester County government. Mm -hmm. What role can government play in that? They're the broker, you know. They're, they're the ones who manage the asset, you know, who create, I, let me put it this way, and I'm not a government guy. <laughs> so I will, I will caveat that right now, okay? But I believe that there's an opportunity to be knowledgeable on the power of the asset to understand the stakeholders who can engage and solicit that power, and then to understand those who are not at the table, who need the capabilities that this thing has to offer, and homogenize that, okay, and, and be equitable. But, it, but I think it's about being informed. Know you've got a tiger by the tail, what is it capable of, and how can I leverage it for a positive?
So that's Bridget Gibbons from uh, the Westchester <laughs> County, <laughs> for those in the back. Um, excellent point. It, look, one of the things that we have, we have noticed more coming out of, this, out of this pandemic, and I know you want to get to the next question, is the need for alignment between the public and the private yeah, sector. Absolutely. Um, whether it's the digital divide, whether it's our affordable housing prices, um, all these things require greater partnership between the public and the private sector. And, and giving them a voice, and, and it, it's critical. You know, it's well, well, I mean, it's a good transition because, I mean, RXR really is known for being a convener in your own right and using your, um, your projects as a means to transform communities, engage stakeholders locally. So it, how are you succeeding in that space to get communities to engage with you so that municipal home rule and that typical command control regulatory <laughs> approach to how you build stuff isn't yeah. the barrier that it sometimes can be? Um, I have a super easy short answer for you on that one. Um, look, development is tough, right? Pre-pandemic, we, we take an approach um, where at the end of the day, you have to engage with the community. It is a, it, we employ so an air game and a ground game. We're the master developer in downtown New Rochelle. We're also a multifamily in Yonkers, but also significant presence in Brooklyn, as well as, um, as, well as uh, commercial operations in, in Manhattan. What we did throughout the pandemic and how we approach development in general, as, you just, as, as the previous speaker just said, it can't just be about a location. Right? It can't be, this is an excellent parcel that will have less than a half a mile to the New Rochelle train station and I build it as quickly as possible and I can lease it up as quickly as possible and have a fantastic return. Um, from the ESG standpoint, it is actually how do we leverage the development itself from local hiring, supporting small businesses. Those all should be just basics. The gentleman who talked about um, sort of what commercial office building should look like in terms of making them safer and more sustainable, those should just be basics. They should be inherent in every single commercial office space. Same thing applies in when it comes to residential. But then we try and take it a, a step further. Um, we've set up from COVID relief funds to RXR volunteer programs in which what basically from our universe within the RXR family, from our partners, our tenants, et cetera, all of us, which I'm happy we're in person right now, when we were working from home, in times of crisis, we like to help. So we established a new RXR volunteer platform in which I have lawyers and lots of tech guys that are much, have much greater expertise in this world um, that worked with small businesses to tra help them transition from a physical footprint to a digital transplant um, footprint. We partnered with Westchester County government on that. And I, I say that from the standpoint that it, the status quo, the pre-pandemic playbook has to be a thing of the past, not only from the private side, but also very much from the public side. And having that partner is essential to actually having a, a strong development move forward that encompasses all those things of having the alignment of the right return, what is the benefit to the community, and how do we create a more sustainable environment? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, the alliance issue, uh, community, the public, the private sector, and, and even workforce development and education, I think, plays, plays a role in, 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 in sort of getting the right voices, getting the right perspectives together. That's outstanding. Let's pivot a little bit to the E and the S. And, 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 and Carl, why don't you kick us off a little bit on your sort of broader perspective on, on some of these issues? So um, I originally want to talk about kind of the evolution of the E over the years in tech, um, but I think I can quickly sum it up as I think E used to be kind of a minor annoyance. It was based on kind of permitting things, and if you were developing in a green field, you had to worry about things, and if you're de developing a brown field, you had to worry about things. And the, the E, the environmental health and safety aspect of tech, is pretty minimal. There's not a lot of permitting. There's not a lot of health and safety issues except ergonomics, and that's relatively new. So I think the three things that I want to talk about on the environmental side are data, uh, climate, and those two things go hand in hand, and then stakeholder engagement. So on the data side, the statistic I've seen is that every year, humanity um, generates the same amount of data that humanity previously generated hmm. ever. So every year, you're taking what has previously been generated and generating that every year. So where does all that get stored? Um, our keynote speaker talked about deleting your emails. 
small things like that, having pictures, all of that takes up server space, and taking up server space produces emissions. So when you're generating this data and your companies are building data centers, Facebook, Amazon, Google, all of, you know, every, everyone needs server space. You're, ge you're generating emissions. You, you, and if the power goes out, you need to run a generator and you'd have to have uninterruptible power supplies. And if there's a tech failure, everyone loses huge money. But in managing all this data, there's also all this talk of decarbonization. So these two things are kind of in conflict with each other. So how does the, the real estate community and these oper how do the operators of these spaces reconcile this? And I don't think there's a great answer. Um, I, I do think there are, um, you know, the, the presentation we saw, there are green data initiatives. Uh, there are a lot of educational uh, things you can do. Uh, one of them is just teaching people to delete things they don't need, which is pretty simple. Uh, but there's also some top level kind of government um, <coughs> initiative. So on Friday, the EPA dropped a 120 page draft on um, uh, incorporating climate change and environmental justice into every policy decision that they make. Um, and it, that's an EPA thing, it's strictly environmental, but that kind of plays a role here. So we're gonna think about uh, the climate in every decision we make. So are we gonna permit this thing? Are we going to um, uh, force resiliency measures here? So if, you, if, you, if you're building new real estate development, should you raise your infrastructure if you're in a flood zone? Will your insurance company even allow you to operate it if you don't do that? Um, I should mention that I don't even own a suit anymore because <laughs> I, um, my, I live on the other beautiful river, uh, the Westchester um, executive talked about his beautiful river. I live on the Delaware and my little town was flooded entirely by Ida and my suit was at the dry cleaners. And I, that's a very minor uh, effect to me, uh, but you know, this, these kind of 100 and 500 year storms are just kind of normal now. They're not really 100 and 500 year storms anymore. So in developing all this real estate and collecting all this data, how are we gonna store it? How are we going to uh, operate uh, in the future? Um, the last piece, and I've been talking for a while now, is stakeholder engagement. So it used to be you held public meetings, you got your approvals, you built your building. Now you gotta think about the community, you have to think about a sense of place, you have to think about environmental justice, and the EPA is making sure of that. Uh, there's actually a, a law in New Jersey already that talks about environmental justice and is actually coming up with regulations on that. Um, you need to talk to your tenants. Your tenants probably now have sustainability goals. Are you able to fulfill those goals? I mean, if, if you have an inefficient building and the tenant has these decarbonization goals, that's not really a good match. I, I think we can kind of match up with the last question a little bit. Can the real estate community in searching for tenants, ask them to contribute in other ways. If they have sustainability goals for broadband connectivity, can they offer that to the larger public? So the stakeholder piece uh, has become really important and it crosswalks into the social piece of the ESG, uh, which I think we'll talk about next and we'll keep this conversation yep. going. But the last thing I wanna say, back to the Wells Fargo sheet, deployment of capital. If you want private money, you're gonna to have to consider all of these things. It's not just gonna be uh, available anymore. You're gonna to have to show that you have considered the E, the S, and the G in all of your decision making, and they're gonna hold you to it. And this thing name drops Larry Fink and Joe Biden and Janet Yellen, and that's for good reason, because from the highest levels, uh, and it's, it'll go all the way down to county government and all the way down to municipal government, but you're gonna to have to prove that you're doing something in this, in this area. You're not gonna have access to money anymore. Uh, it's a pretty simple concept, and if anybody wants to No, I, 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 I agree. We, we've actually just traveled over to Europe for the first time in, number, um, in a year and a half, a number of investors were asking exactly that, our ESG platform. Um, but as you, as you were describing the server space that's required, and, and I'm sure that, that carbon emissions are coming from that server, um, the, the amount of Zoom meetings and emails spiked, and our commercial office buildings in Midtown Manhattan, they're probably 10% occupied, but I am using about 85% of my energy. So the challenge that we face, and I actually would love to hear from the tech guys, mm -hmm. of not only how do we address these types of things, 
because there, there is not a simple answer. There is a law in New York City which requires us to make sure our buildings are emitting less energy um, without having the available alternative energy sources. Um, well, you also mentioned without, about the EPA in terms of number of regulations, what's looking for. It's really difficult to build, not to put Westchester County on the spot or any other government agency in here. It is very, it, yes, we talked about the um, community, but also getting through the approval processes can be quite cumbersome. So I'd just be curious from you all, I'd love, it, what, is, what is the one technological solution for us to be able to build as quickly as possible that is sustainable and energy efficient, that creates growth, creates jobs, all the things that everybody in this room is looking for, but at the same time, reach those, those sustainable goals. What do you think, Charlie? So I'm a big believer in the 80-20 rule, right? You know, 20% has, you know, captures 80% of the issues, right? Mm -hmm. So when we're looking at how we're approaching, and I'll, I'm gonna lead into kind of the next question, which is how do you anticipate the unforeseen? Because this is, it's all tied together. Yeah. Um, the unforeseen really, we've learned from COVID that it happens. And when we also learn from COVID, what do I need to know? I need data. I need insights, okay? How do I get insights? I get it from data. How do I get the data? I get it from my systems. So right now we're building projects. We have legacy projects, but frankly we're building new projects that do two things. One, we're still doing it in a siloed way, although there's some outliers. RxR I know is on the bleeding edge of that. Um, but we're also leading with a tech first perspective, and that's wrong. The outcomes should be what leads the conversation. Yeah. Where do I want to be when it's all done? Mm -hmm. When you start a project, it is a, it is a blank sheet of paper. Yep. Where do I want to be? Then what ends up happening is when I understand where I want to be, now I know the technology that's required to deliver that to me. And the majority of that technology is already in the project. It's the security systems, it's the lighting systems, it's the mechanical systems, and so on. So, it's not a question of dynamically changing what we do. It's asking the questions earlier mm -hmm. to get the insights, to anticipate the outcomes, and then work through the same process we have about pulling it together so that we can achieve those things. And there's technologies available to do that, but it's not about the tech. It's about the outcomes. It's, it's, it's prior, defining and prioritizing the impacts and the outcomes and being transparent on both the positive and the negative impacts and outcomes. Uh, that. But the, the thing I'll just add on the technology is, and this is transcending all the industry sectors, is that it, the, the, the velocity of change is taking place in such a manner that the capturing of data to report on the progress, for example, on emissions and, 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 and environmental and social responsibility issues and all, is not keeping pace. So, so lots of data, not enough uh, sort of robust technology yet to really capture and report that data. Well, is, I'll, I'll jump yeah. on that for just a second. The only thing inside that I'll give on that is that when I know the outcomes that I want, I don't need to collect as much data. So there's, there's a tendency there's to collect precision. all the data in the precision. world. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's being stored, it's underutilized, and so on. If I know the outcomes, I know the data. Absolutely. Christopher, well, let me give you some the last thoughts before we go to the yeah, Q&A. Just, just to add that conversation, and I, I was reflecting on this before we came in today, and I was thinking about the wireless industry and where we were 10 years ago. And 10 years ago, we were starting to build out 4G LTE networks, which at the time were you know, the latest, greatest generation of wireless. And in the building community, um, if you had you know huge vertical space in the city, uh, maybe an enterprise function that was demanding it, or special venues like football stadiums, you'd build out these proprietary networks, um, costly, um, specific equipment and hardware, um, not really good at capturing data, but maybe throughputting service to mm -hmm. the consumer. Uh, and we kind of got to a point where that was a decent solution for certain um, segments of the real estate market, but the small scale, the mid prize, we couldn't make the numbers work, it didn't pencil out. And I think that's really where there is transformative opportunity because when you start to look at 5G and wireless connectivity or IoT and enterprise of things, when we start to attach sensors to everything where, where we can do it, as you're saying, where what's the outcome we want, the data we need, but now we can collect it and, and kind of actually aggregate it and make it a much more um, uh, 
a useful set of circumstances, and then we have real-time data, and if you're a building owner, you can manage the systems, and I'm gonna kind of come back to what Kyle was saying. Um, you look at that, and that's real opportunity, and it's becoming more affordable and able to implement. Um, so I think that's the, that's the difference, and when I look at even our, uh, the wireless industry as a whole, 5G itself, when you said about the data center and, and, and energy uses, it's a problem. The, the industry itself is through migration, 3G, 4G, 5G, actually reducing energy consumption with every single transition, but the demand spike is so high, you can't keep up with it. So it's a fascinating conversation, but I think, I think the technologies, we're right at that point where mm -hmm. we can start to do so much more, uh, including AI and all kinds of topics. Right. Well, and you said something about aggregating. I, I, I wanna put a, a, a you know, fine point on that. Be aware. The, the, the solutions are not mature, okay? There is no, you know, when, when one tends to look for a solution, they tend to look for a product or, or a vendor or, you know, it doesn't exist, all right? So the aggregating and the connecting of these systems and, and creating a, a, an ecosystem really is the focus um, allows us to get, you know, through that aggregation, the complete picture. Yep. Because we're not, we're not there yet. I mean, even simple things as occupancy sensing. We use cameras, beacons, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, turnstile, et cetera to get a complete picture. So aggregation, I think, and that concept of um, piecing these together is key. Okay. One, one last on yep. that. I'll take the, the bullet for my industry. Um, <laughs> my industry hasn't always done the greatest job explaining the benefit of that and why its infrastructure is the enabler and how we can get to a better shared resource, a better understanding of data, how it can be used in smart city applications. And I think that's part of the conversation, even I've come back to what Bridget was saying, about our conversations on a very local level. You know, yes, we understand municipal home rule, we understand aesthetics, we understand all the different kind of tools in that toolbox, but we really have to have the conversation locally about why this is critical infrastructure, and we can't really delay its rollout, and it is gonna be the enabler for some of these solutions we're looking yeah. for. So, so as, just on a final note on, on as, as the person that's rooted in the G and ESG, the often forgotten part of the ESG equation, uh, we have to think also about the privacy and regulatory issues around the data yep. that's being moved around. Just if you just think of the cloud computing paradigm at the moment, there are many organizations, large, sophisticated organizations that are having trouble really even identifying where all their data is in servers around the globe at the moment. And, and there's, there are big efforts going on to, to inventory uh, servers and data. So, so as we continue to progress, uh, these, these privacy and regulatory issues are of concern. So we'd like to open it up to the audience for a few minutes on, on, on questions. Yes, please. And in a balanced way with all stakeholders' views being, being perceived, yeah. I was going to talk again a little bit about the, the EPA integrating environmental justice into its every policy decision. So when you talk right of way, I think permitting, I think uh, public permitting, I think comment process, I think review process, and I think all of these systems already exist, but if they didn't, that would be the perfect opportunity to incorporate all of that environmental justice, uh, the importance of environmental justice into building that right of way. So is there a way to, to take the existing infrastructure and, and reincorporate that? 
And, it, and it, the, one of the things you said is it's very difficult to build a building. Is it harder to build a building or retrofit a building in, in a modern society? Right. I don't know. And we should do both. I mean, uh, the, the county executive talked about repositioning existing assets. Yeah. Um, I think there's a great opportunity. Um, talking with uh, with Steve um, earlier in terms of, uh, of, of Lower Manhattan and how Lower Manhattan diversified its asset class in, after 9-11, which it was able to navigate COVID much better than Midtown Manhattan. Same applies here in Westchester. There are a number of inherent strengths here in Westchester from not only connectivity to New York City with a great public transportation system, a great airport that, that has seen better days, um, uh, uh, the world-class um, um, educational institutions, MasterCard, et cetera. There's, there's so many different elements. How do we look at some of the existing assets? And this, we're, we're having this conversation on the commercial office space right now. Right now, everybody's declared commercial office space dead. It's not dead. There are c commercial office buildings, probably your Class B and Class C office buildings that are not going to make it and probably shouldn't, and opportunities to reposition those types of assets for things like housing. How can we look at different assets in places like Westchester? But to your point in terms of the public right of way, I think at the end of the day, it comes down to, to sound planning and sort of how we view these things. And when we look at development, whether it's a municipality like New Rochelle or Glen Cove or, or, or Yonkers, is do you have the leadership within government that has the big picture viewpoint, that has the ability to weather which are gonna be inevitable political storms on any type of change. Like at the end of the day, people are just very resistant to change, we're never gonna make people happy. But if you have the ability in which you have uh, elected officials that have the ability to navigate that, that have a vision of what they're looking for, establish the sort of the rules of the road that the private sector can operate in, because at the end of the day, there's some very innovative private sector operators that are gonna figure out a way to make it work along with the, as, as there is alignment with the government entity. And so having those, and it's, it's I, I'm, I'm oversimplifying that obviously, but that at the end of the day is what we have seen is how those things actually start to move forward. And to give you some comfort, it's not the design. The design is the slave to what everybody values. There may be cost implications, there may be schedule implications, mm -hmm. there may be rights of way implications, but the technology and the know-how exist to do and to deliver the outcomes. I, I disagree. Yeah. Okay. The, the environmental bigotry that you can see if you map where digital resources are is very easy to find in the existing mm -hmm. mapping of digital resources. And the lack of a design conversation about how to address that problem is a problem of culture and of design. Yeah, I'm talking about the, on the technology side of it. We have the ability to deliver the technology and the solutions, okay? But it's a question of what's the outcome? What's, you know, what's the, what's the, the, the priorities? I'll, I'll weigh, in, weigh in a little bit. I, I love the concept of intelligent uh, right away. And I, I think it goes back to a little bit of what I was saying before where the federal, state, and local construct uh, can help or hinder in this conversation. And when we look at right-of-way, and I do a lot of work for the telecommunications sector involving the right-of-way, um, my view, and this is already established federally and there's tons of FCC leadership on this, the right-of-way is a conduit for this public benefit for these communications companies to build out. And there's a debate, and it's been a debate that's been um, back and forth at the FCC over the last few years. We could talk about net neutrality, all kinds of different conversations, where should we empower states and localities to ask for more for their use of the right of way or do we understand that we want competition as the overarching principle and allow providers to build out in the right of way somewhat unfettered with just management of the right of way the reality is the law says it's management of the right of way we really don't want in this country to give states and localities the power to dictate the marketplace in that way and so that could be a debatable point, federal, state, and local, but that's where we are. That's why I come back to, and I say um, kind of to the group, um, that's a construct I don't think any of us is gonna change overnight in Washington. Let's deal with the facts and the law we got, and let's actually solve some problems, and if we've got digital deserts, 
We can find the ways to bring the private sector to the table. We can be creative. We can use the intelligent right away to get the services, but, but we gotta be smart about that conversation. It's not gonna be with um, all carrots or all sticks. Thank you for that question. Other questions? Yes, please. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. I, I mostly agree with what you're saying, Chris, but uh, I think that you see throughout the country there's different community needs you know, for, for different types of technologies and, and solutions. And I wonder if, um, if you feel that Westchester, because it, it's such a large county with, with different needs, right? North Salem has very different needs than maybe Mount Vernon. Um, do you need different strategies for um, you know, connecting the unserved marketplace, both wirelessly and, and with either FiberLine or Wireline? Uh, that's Bob Knight. He said mostly, not everything. So uh, I, I, I appreciate and respect that coming from him, a, a leader in the broadband space himself. Um, yeah, I think that this is not a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, you look at Westchester in particular, um, we have areas where um, maybe there's no wireless service. The, the reality, and, and I apologize to my northern Westchester friends and government, is because the local populace doesn't want us to build towers in those communities. Um, we have areas where it's really expensive in, in terms of providing broadband service because maybe the local construct for digging up the streets, repaving everything is really a capital intensive structural barrier to building out more broad, robust broadband. How you solve those problems, if you understand that that's the actual on the playing field situation in Westchester, are very different. And the solutions for northern Westchester and what I think the Y zone, for example, is really trying to accomplish, which is um, internet access and affordability, are very different. So I don't think it's one size fits all. Um, it can be very uh, acknowledged, challenging to get the right stakeholders in the room to get the right solution. But if we have a dedication to it and uh, the right people, and we see that this is really critical for Westchester's uh, overall economic health, and more importantly, the well-being of all people in this county, then we'll get to it. And, and, and that's what I think we've got to do. And I mostly agree with your answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, other questions? We'll, we'll take one more question. We're running out of time. Yes, please. Yeah, I don't have a good answer for you either. I mean, I, I, at the end of the day, I don't think it can be solved just via the office space, right? right? Yeah. If you, um, what the county executive said earlier, what's great about Westchester, it's not New York, it's close to New York, right? And when you look at Westchester and you look at the affordable um, housing challenges that are taking place in New York City, and the city itself should not bear the brunt of that housing, right? You have 27,000 per, um, people per square mile in the city, you have 2,700 here in Westchester. Um, there is a lot of opportunity given the incredible amount of public transportation infrastructure throughout Westchester County, opportunity for more housing. Another of those things that is going to be very difficult to move, some, some places are, are more accepting than others, but at the end of the day, increasing that density in places like Westchester does give those office spaces an opportunity to be able to perform and compete. One of the things that we have found, and it's on my mind because I, I literally was just on the phone with, uh, with, a, with a New York Times reporter for coming in here. Um, a year ago, I, I had to fight with office space is dead. Nobody's ever gonna come back to the office, especially in New York. Well, that's wrong. Um, it's, we're, we're finding actually more and more companies, the biggest companies um, in the world. Google just made a $2 billion commitment for Midtown Manhattan 
for a new, actually more in Chelsea. Um, other major companies are announcing their, their return to the office. But there is a structural shift. There is going to be an element where there are certain cohorts of workers. I think the young people, a lot of the talent that they want to attract, they may want to stay in the city. But there may be a cohort of workers, young children, maybe older children, particularly as we're figuring out what the hybrid work structure looks like. Is that office space the possibility for potential co-working space? Right? It may not be filled five days a week, complemented with potential residential. Is there a way to activate it that way? There's no sort of, as we've heard, there's no one size fits all, but there are major structural shifts that are taking place and how we capitalize. And a lot of people will say, well, we know it's going to go this, you know, people don't know just yet. I think what we're going to see is, to his credit, the mayor's brought back all the, the kids in New York City. He's brought back the city's workforce, which has been phenomenal. Unfortunately, a number of private companies have not followed his lead. Hopefully they start to come back. But I don't think people are gonna be coming back to the office in Midtown Manhattan five days a week. I don't plan on it. I'm a Westchester resident. I'm gonna probably come in three or four days a week. So how does Westchester capitalize on that? And one other thing, I know we're running out of time. We didn't mention this, and we talked about energy and sustainability, but one of the things that we've now factored into our ESG is COVID. Right? We are now, I, I became a public health expert, just like so many of us have, right? We've become public health experts, and so how we've talked about health and wellness in terms of ESG pre-COVID, but it now has become more of a priority. So we've vaccinated, we've mandated a vaccine for all of our team members. Anybody that comes visit us, we have to show proof, they have to show proof of vaccination. This is, Unfortunately, for better or for worse, we have to find ways to coexist with these type of, uh, of public health threats. So as landowners, as, as, as owners, operators, developers, how are we factoring that in to our own development, own operations? That's another one of those major structural shifts when it comes to ESG. Thank you for that. You know, exciting times, I think, now. Innovation has never been more important. Um, disruption is occurring, though. There are challenges, there are risks, there are uncertainties. One of, my, one of the uncertainties that I'm facing with at the moment is, is the Red Sox and the Yankees game uh, this, <laughs> this, this evening, for example. But, 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 but on a serious note, I hope, I hope this was helpful. Thank you, panel. Uh, thank you, audience. Michael, thank you uh, and your team for the opportunity and, and, and looking forward to seeing you uh, after the event. All right, a couple of closing thoughts before we head outside for some food and drink. Um, thanks to the panel, fantastic discussion. Thanks to our keynote. <laughs> thanks to all of today's sponsors. Um, and thanks to all of you for showing up. So those of you who follow these issues know that uh, the state has a very aggressive climate plan with some very aggressive targets for the future. And the Climate Action Council will be coming out early next year with their scoping plan. Um, anybody who follows this stuff as closely as I do knows that there's gonna have to be a demand side element to this if we are to bridge that gap between our energy needs and what can reasonably be supplied, particularly in the context of the closing of Indian Point and the natural gas moratorium. So Westchester has some unique challenges. And as Bridget pointed out, we've got home rule in Westchester. And of those, again, looking at Washington, Politics can be very fickle. If we want to get to a post-political space, the private sector is going to have to step up and lead on these issues. And one of the ways to do that is if they talk about smart buildings and lowering the, lowering the, the energy footprint of the places that we live and work. Um, there are a lot of programs available out there. One of the things that the Westchester County Association has done, it's created a clean energy portal, which is an online navigator to help businesses find these programs and these incentive monies to help their businesses to move towards a clean energy future. Uh, we've got some demos outside of that. There's a few ladies from the Pace Energy and Climate Center who helped create this with the Westchester County Association. So I hope you'll visit the, the desk out there and take a look at that. Also, the folks from Dandelion, that's a geothermal company, is out there and um, has some ideas about geothermal, particularly in the, in the single family home and the town home uh, at development. The end. Let's go enjoy ourselves.